Okay, that seems to work. Let's do the recording to it as a backup. Yeah, all right, I would say uh, let's let's get started. Some people are still joining, but I think we can go ahead. Um, yeah, so thanks everyone for for coming to this last session in 2021 of our research seminar. And uh, yeah, it's my great pleasure to introduce introduce Luca De Feo um, from IBM Research. Uh, Luca holds a, a PhD from Ecole Polytechnique uh, in France, where he finished in 2010, um, working on computer algebra and computational number theory. And afterwards, he joined uh, Universi Université de Versailles in 2011 as an assistant professor, uh, where he also kept working on computer al algebra and cryptography. Yeah, and as I said, currently he's working on at IBM uh, research in Zurich, as far as I remember. And uh, they works on post-quantum cryptography and related topics. And today he will talk about isogenies as a foundation of time delay cryptography. So yeah, Luca, the stage is all yours. Thanks very much for the introduction, Philip. And thanks, Philip and Maria, for the invitation. Uh, let me start with the screen sharing. Um, are you seeing the screen? Yes. Great. Okay. So, um, as uh, Philip said, I'm now working on post quantum cryptography, but today is not going to be about post quantum. I would like, I would love it was, but unfortunately, we don't know how to do this stuff uh, in a quantum safe way. But what's cool is that we know how to do it from isogenous. And so, yeah, this is um, what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so, um, I will talk about time delay cryptography first, and then I will explain how we use isogenies uh, to, uh, to construct this kind of protocols. Um, I may have made a little bit too many slides, uh, so I may not be able to go through all of them. We'll see. Um, let's start from time delay cryptography. What, um, uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, what is time delay cryptography? This is a um, fairly old concept, and at the same time, is not a very well-defined concept. There's not been uh, much research on it, on it for, uh, uh, for a long time. Um, it goes back to uh, an early protocol by an early scheme by uh, Rivas, Schramier, and Wagner, which we're going to see, um, which is usually been referred to as time lock puzzles. Um, and the field has been expanding recently to um, uh, to new primitives. Uh, so that, that's been uh, something that's been uh, discussed a lot in recent times, uh, verifiable delay functions. You may have heard of, uh, of the name. Um, and some more uh, recent results, which were presented at uh, last Eurocrypt. Um, so what's, um, what's the idea behind this time delay cryptography? Well, first of all, what's the goal of time delay cryptography? Um, you may have different kinds of goals, but really what what interests really people is uh, using time delay cryptography to remove trusted parties from distributed protocols. Um, so think of very simple distributed protocols like an auction or a lottery or voting, which is not so simple. Um, whenever in these protocols you have a trusted uh, party, you can always think of removing that trusted party by using an MPC um, uh, implementation of the party so that all the participants of the, of the protocol realize the functionality and so we don't need to trust anyone. Um, this, from a theoretical point of, work, uh, point of view, always works, but of course it may be quite expensive. Um, time DLA cryptography is a different way to remove these trusted parties um, Pro probably, at least as far as we know, not as generic as MPC. It cannot do as much as MPC can. Uh, but in some instances, for some specific protocols, it offers an alternative which may be um, more efficient in certain contexts. And uh, yeah, usually the context is 
like we want to scale these protocols to many participants and uh, to to an extent to which MPC does not scale well. And time delay cryptography may offer a way to do these things better. Um, so let's try to understand what, what we mean by time delay cryptography. Um, the question is um, essentially how long it is going to take to do some operation in a cryptographic sense. So let's say Alice sends a, Bob, a message to Bob. Um, how long is it going to take for uh, Bob or maybe for an adversary to decrypt the message? And the usual answers in, uh, in cryptography are uh, not the kind of uh, answers that we look for in time delay cryptography. So you may be used to, uh, to uh, think of the complexity theory point of view. Uh, you just want that uh, the gap between the times it takes to decrypt for Bob uh, and the time it takes to, the, to decrypt for Eve um, has a, an exponential gap uh, so that uh, the legitimate receiver takes polynomial time and maybe the, uh, uh, the attacker takes exponential time to decrypt. Um, this is usually an, an asymptotic kind of reasoning and it doesn't say much on the constants. Um, so you may have to be careful how you use these arguments in practice. Uh, but um, it's even more, uh, it's, it's even less useful in the real world if you really want to enforce some kind of gap uh, in practice, in that these arguments are usually uh, average case analysis. So on average, Eve is going to take a certain amount of time more than Bob, but it, it ignores worst case. Um, and usually also the way you do this kind of reduction is based on some models which do not necessarily fit the reality of uh, the silicon you, uh, you have at your disposal. And then there's on the opposite side, there is the real world crypto point of view, which says, well, I want uh, Eve to be able to decrypt the message in not less than two power 128 operations, for example. Uh, but then you have a couple of problems. Like, first of all, what's an operation exactly? You need to define your um, uh, unit uh, complexity uh, step. Um, and of course, you have many different models in, in which you can do this, more or less theoretical. And the way you uh, decide um, how long it is going to take to Eve to decrypt is usually going to be based on extrapolations, especially if you think about, for example, the way we set the difficulty level for RSA, the way we set uh, the parameters is by running the number field C on uh, relatively smaller examples, and from that extrapolating how long it would take to uh, break a 2,000-bit uh, RSA modules, for example. Uh, Things are, of course, a little bit simpler for symmetric crypto, but in general, uh, you use extrapolations. Another problem with this, it, it doesn't really account for parallelism. So it doesn't, it is not really a measure of how long it is going to take to Eve to decrypt the message. It's more a, a measure of how much it is going to cost Eve. But uh, if you think of um, breaking, for example, uh, AES, for, uh, for example, uh, where exhaustive search is your only way, then this is a massively parallelizable algorithm. So you cannot say that it is going to take Eve a two power 128 seconds, milliseconds, nanoseconds. You can only say that um, the product of time and the number of processors that Eve has at her disposal uh, is bounded by uh, below by two power 128. Um, so this is really not a measure of time. Uh, time delay cryptography is a different approach to um, computational difficulty, which really tends, tries to enforce a certain amount of time, as in a clock time, time that passes for um, someone on Earth. Um, and so the first, the very first concept of time lock puzzles, uh, which, as I said, was defined by um, Rivas, Shamir, and Wagner, um, is something that you can essentially think about as a key derivation function. Um, so you have two algorithms, uh, one which is the um, typical key derivation, um, one that uses a trapdoor and a parameter delta, which is a delay, uh, and another algorithm, which we call the slow key derivation function, which does not take the trapdoor, only takes in the parameter delta, and then you have some bits, some pseudo-random bits that you use to input to the, to the key derivation function. And the goal is that these two algorithms have the same output so that you can derive the function uh, using either of the two algorithms, uh, sorry, you can derive the key using the, either of the two algorithms. However, if you are in possession of the trapdoor, then uh, you will be able to derive the key uh, fast 
Whereas if you only uh, can run slow, the, the slow KDF function, it will take some time. And so the idea for the, of this kind of uh, primitive is that you can use it to encrypt to the future. So uh, think, for example, of uh, Fred of the Flintstones who wants to send a message to the future. Uh, what he will do is that he will use key derivation, the KDF function to encrypt his message. And he will set the parameter delta, the delay, to uh, a million years. And then he will just um, give this, uh, capsule this uh, time capsule away. And then time will pass until we arrive one million years later when this locate derivation function uh, has finished computing, we will have the key to decrypt the message. Um, so this is the kind of functionality that a time lock puzzle is um, trying to, um, uh, to realize. And what can you use it for? Well, there's of course more than one application. It's pretty easy to see how you could use this for uh, key escrow, for example. Uh, like you have a, a key escrow system where the key will only be escrowable sometimes in the future. Uh, so like you encrypt messages, but uh, a judge who wants to decrypt the message, he will, the messages will have to wait uh, a couple of years before you can decrypt the messages so that you have the time to flee the country and do all your uh, white collar crimes you want. Um, auctions, voting are other applications and uh, we may start from the auction example uh, because it's a very instructive one. Um, so the question is, uh, going back to the first uh, question we had in the talk, is how do you run a, uh, an auction without using a trusted party? Of course, uh, if you have a trusted party, it's the usual way you run a sealed bid auction, right? Everyone puts his, uh, his offer into a, uh, an envelope. The envelopes are given to the trusted party. Then after all the envelopes are in, the trusted party opens the envelope and sees who has, uh, the, uh, who has given the, the highest offer. Um, if you don't want to use the trusted party, an obvious idea is to use a, a commitment, a cryptographic commitment. So uh, let's say we want to auction this kind of NFT. Um, and so what can you do? You can uh, have all the participants uh, publish a commitment uh, to their offer. So this commitment is just a hash of their offer. And so you can take, like, take this example. We have two participants who are each committing to their offer. And now let's uh, spice a little bit the thing. And let's say that we have decided that um, this is a second uh, bid auction, meaning that the participant who makes the highest offer will win the item, will win the NFT, but the participant, uh, but he will only pay the cost that has been offered by the second highest bid. Um, people in blockchain like a lot of this kind of second price auctions um, because from a game theoretic point of view, they are uh, more fair uh, to the participants. So in, uh, in some complex game theoretic uh, protocols, it's, it's interesting to have these kind of options. And so now, of course, after every participant has uh, given uh, his commitment, now we are ready to open the commitments. So the first participant's opening his commitment, he reveals uh, the pre-image to the hash, and we see that he has offered 1 million uh, coins um, and then there is some randomness to uh, to get some uh, to get a masking, a, a, an information theoretic masking. Um, but then, what happens if the second participant uh, doesn't reveal his bit? Now, the first participant is screwed because maybe he overbid by a lot. He offered one million coins, but he was betting on the other participant only offering a hundred coins. And now he's very disappointed because uh, there is no second price to pay. Um, so this problem of participants refusing to open their commitments makes this uh, very simple uh, commit and reveal idea for auctions um, not the ideal solution, right? Um, so what can we do? Well, if we have a time lock puzzle, we have a, an obvious solution to the problem. Instead of using a commit then reveal scheme, we can use uh, a, uh, the time lock puzzle to do a key derivation. And then we use this key to encrypt the bit so that then you have two choices. So every participant derives a key using a, the fast KDF function. So they encrypt the bid, then they reveal the, their encryption. Um, and then uh, when all the bids are in, everyone can reveal the trapdoor to recompute the key, the, the, the key and then decrypt the bids. But if some participants are uncooperative, we can still use the slow key derivation function to decrypt their bids. 
So if you're using this kind of strategy, this means that the only thing you need to, uh, to guarantee is that all the bids are in before the slow key derivation function has the time to finish. Um, of course, you need to, uh, to, to do this before the, the key derivation function has time to finish. Otherwise, people could just decrypt everyone's bids and then uh, they could cheat the, the auction. Um, so this is a decent solution to the auction. Um, there is a problem is that if you have a large auction with many participants um, and many of them are uncooperative, then you will have to run the slow key derivation function on all of them. And I mean, this can be quite expensive. Of course, you can run it in parallel on all of them. So it won't take longer than just decrypting from one participant, but it may cost a lot. If you need to run a thousand slow key derivation functions in parallel, you need a lot of resources. Um, so this is, does not really scale in an ideal way. And um, there is also something strange in this protocol is that you have two ways to decrypt the bits, which feels a bit unnecessary. You would be happy with like having just a single way. Why there not the, does there need to be a trapdoor in this system? So we will see that in recent development, we found a better way to implement this kind of protocol. But first let's move to the other uh, primitive, to the other time delay primitive that uh, has been uh, very popular recently, um, which is verifiable delay functions. Um, so a verifiable delay function is a sort of uh, proof of sequential work with one additional requirement is that the, the output of the proof, like the proof itself, it's deterministic. So it's, it's a function. Uh, it has one input and gives one output. Um, so um, technically it is a function family from some input space X to some output space Y, uh, such that evaluating the function takes a long time, but verifying that uh, F of X is equal to Y, given uh, the input and the output of the function is efficient. Ideally, you, you would like to have an exponential separation between the time it takes to uh, verify uh, the function and the time it takes to evaluate the function, like in the worst case, at least. Like you want to be able to scale up to exponential. Um, but you also want all the things that I said before about this time delay cryptography. You want the, the time it takes to evaluate this function is predictable, that you know in advance how long it is going to take, and it is going to take the same amount of time, roughly at least, on all possible inputs. Um, technically, you want it to be on almost all randomly chosen inputs because of course, you're always allowed to pre-compute some. And for those, you will be able immediately to output them from a pre-computed table. Uh, but you want that if I receive a random input X, then on average, uh, like on average on the inputs, it should always take the same amount of time. Um, so, you can think of this as uh, like the, the old problem, uh, Jules Verne's uh, the, uh, around the world in 80 days. Like Phileas Fogg had done his tour, uh, his world tour in 80 days. Um, so he had done some long delay thing, but how does he prove when he comes back that he really has done uh, this job? Of course, Phileas Fogg didn't need to prove because he's a gentleman and everyone believes a gentleman. But nowadays, gentlemen are a rare species. So uh, we would like to have something that's cryptographically guaranteed. Um, and so let's try, let's give also an application for this kind of verifiable delay function. What can we do with it? What's, um, uh, what's one of the um, simplest application we can imagine? Um, this is lotteries, for example, or something else called the random beacons, which are essentially the same thing. Um, but let's take the example of a lottery. Let's say we have uh, a certain number of participants, call them A to Z, uh, and they want to agree on a random, uniformly random maybe, winning ticket for a lottery. Um, so, um, and of course, they don't want to have a trusted party which draws the, um, uh, the winning ticket. So they want a distributed protocol that where, they, um, uh, where they all contribute some randomness. And then from this randomness, out comes uh, the winner. So a very simple uh, idea is that just that each participant broadcasts a random string. Then you take the hash of all the strings. And the output of this hash is the winning ticket. But of course, you see that this is flawed because um, the participant who goes last uh, has the choice has the option to uh, read all the uh, broadcast uh, random strings 
and then very quickly trying all possibilities for uh, for his own input until he gets uh, the output of the hash function, which is exactly the ticket he wants to be the winning ticket. So in this way, of course, you can at least influence, if not uh, out, outright win the lottery, but by being uh, by going last essentially, uh, going last and trying many uh, many different random uh, random. Um, so here, verifiable delay functions offer a solution. The idea is that you make the hash, the hash functions ve very slow. Um, let's say that it takes 20 minutes to compute the hash function. And then you ask that all the participants submit their input, their randomness, uh, within 10 minutes. If the input comes after 10 minutes, you are out of, the, of this protocol. If it comes before, then you're in. Um, if you do so, then it means that um, it will still take 10, 10 more minutes to compute the, input, the output of the hash function. And so you are not allowed to try many different inputs just because it takes too long to compute the output of the hash function. Um, but of course, then there is something uh, bad with this is that anyone who wants to check the outcome of the lottery um, will have to rerun this low computation. So a more efficient way to do this is to have a verifiable delay function so that just one person uh, takes the charge of computing the output of the hash function and maybe is even rewarded for this effort. But then after the output of the hash function has been computed, everyone can verify that the output was correct. So that, for example, we can commit this into a block and it will be written forever in the blockchain who the winner of the lot this lottery was. And everyone can quickly check that the blockchain is correct without needing to, do, to take 20 minutes for each block. Um, so of course, I didn't say blockchain uh, at random. This thing is really um, a trend in blockchains because it can, use, it can be used for many things like Ethereum is looking at this as a source of trusted randomness. Um, so essentially to do the same application as the lottery I just showed, but with the only, uh, uh, with the only goal of having some uh, uh, randomness, uh, continuous randomness source that cannot be influenced by the participants, by any participants. Um, another application, which is very cute, it's in the Chia blockchain. Uh, and the, these verifiable delay functions are used as a mechanism to improve the uh, security of uh, proof of space in the case of Chia. This could also be used uh, as a mechanism for, for, for proof of stake. Um, it's a bit more complicated. I won't go into the details, but uh, it, it's a really cute idea on how to use these verifiable delay functions. Um, and now the last uh, time delay primitive um, that uh, I want to talk about, also the last that is known because there is not much more than this. Well, actually there is not more than this as far as I know. It's something that's called delay encryption. So this is something that was presented just at the, a few months ago at uh, the, the last Eurocrypt, although the paper is mm, like two years old almost. So it's been around for a while. Um, you can see this as a generalization of uh, time block puzzles, uh, but with the difference that there is no trapdoor it, and it's a kind of uh, time capsule where lots of different participants can all put stuff into the time capsule and what's in the capsule will only be able, uh, will only be opened sometime in the future. Um, this is an, a generalization of time lock puzzles, but actually it's also a generalization of verifiable delay functions. As we shall see, delay encryption implies both. Um, and so it's certainly a more powerful primitive than either of those. Um, and as far as we know, time lock puzzles and verifiable delay functions are not equivalent. And so this is pointing to the fact that um, neither time lock puzzles nor VDF can imply delay encryption. Um, it is a primitive that uh, today is only known from isogenies. And as applications, interesting application, it has exactly the same uh, auction example, but done in a better way. Um, am I going to show this? I don't remember. Uh, if I forget to show how you can get a better auction, just remind me during the questions. Uh, the same way you can do better auctions, you can do better voting. So it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting uh, primitive. And it would, of course, be interesting to see whether it can be uh, obtained from something else than isogenies, because it seems strange that isogenies are really the only way to do it. Um, it's not obvious because like, it seems that the, there are obstacles to uh, getting it in, uh, in other ways. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a very uh, new uh, primitive that uh, 
in my opinion, should receive uh, some uh, some more research because uh, it could open uh, pave the way to uh, to lots of applications. And yeah, people right now are really looking into how to use these uh, in blockchains. For example, Ethereum has already some applications in mind, and would really like to see this delay encryption uh, running. Uh, if we can manage to run. I will explain later why this seems still a few steps away from being practically usable. Uh, but before I go into delay encryption and isogenous, let's just uh, start from uh, uh, the, some easier uh, things. Let's look at how we can uh, make these delay functions from groups. Um, and so I will start with the uh, reverse Shamir Wagner protocol because this is very simple to understand. It's a very cute trick which uh, should get us started. Uh, so the setup is the same, uh, it's, it's an RSA setup. Uh, you, um, you as the, um, uh, as the participant who runs the k, the, the k derivation function will set up an RSA module so a modulus, so an integer n that's a product of two large primes, you will publish the modulus n, and you will keep p and q private. So of course, under uh, the RSA, uh, under the uh, the hypothesis that factorization is art, uh, no one would be able to recover your private key. Um, now the slow k derivation function is repeated squaring in this uh, in this group in this group of multiplicative integers modulo, like inver uh, invertible integers modulo n. Um, and uh, the, uh, the delay parameter, how long it is going to take to do uh, this, uh, this locate variation function is going to be just the number of times you, uh, you square. So if you start from some input x, you can square once, square twice, etc., until you get to uh, x power two power delta. Um, there is, of course, um, an exponential numbers of uh, values you can go through. Um, but uh, of course, if you know the order of this multiplicative group, um, then you can find a shortcut. Because x to the power 2 to the power delta is the same thing as x to the power 2 to the power delta modulo the order of the group, which is Euler function of n. So of course, if you know the trapdoor, if you know the factorization of n, then you can compute phi of n and you can take this shortcut. And this is the uh, fast key derivation function. You just compute uh, two power delta modulo phi of n, and then you compute x to this exponent. This is going to take a, a logarithmic number of steps in n. Uh, whereas if you don't know uh, the trapdoor, then you're essentially doing squarings in a group in an, of a known order. And conjecturally, there is no faster way to do this than doing this delta square zinc sequence. Um, so this is the basic idea behind the reverse schramier wagner time log puzzle. And um, this is still believed to be uh, secure, usable, um, and module, of course, uh, the security of the RSA function, which, of course, first thing, it's not post-quantum safe, and the module really uh, evaluating how long it is going to take to evaluate this kind of, uh, the, this kind of squarings, uh, you get a secure time block puzzle. Um, there are some problematic assumptions, of course, in this, uh, in this construction. The first thing is that uh, you're, you're essentially counting in your unit of time is uh, a squaring. So you are assuming that a squaring is a squaring, and you cannot do it faster than a certain number of nanoseconds. Let's see. Um, that's the first assumption. And the second assumption is that whoever needs to compute the slow key derivation function uh, is in uh, possession of a machine that is not much slower than this theoretical optimum for a squaring. Um, so if you have a great disparity between the best possible architecture you can imagine to compute a squaring and the one that participants reasonably can afford, then you have a problem because you need to take this gap into account. Um, as far as we know, uh, right, right now, for example, what uh, people in blockchain are doing is that they are uh, implementing squaring modulo n on FPGAs, and then they are thinking of eventually printing ASICs to do this kind of operation. And they're hoping that the best thing a person can do with, I don't know what, a superconducting computer or whatever kind of sci-fi technology you have is not a constant number of times, more than a constant number of times faster than these ASICs they are printing. Uh, the second important assumption is, of course, this assumption that n sequential squarings uh, cannot take uh, less than uh, n squarings one after the other. 
uh, so, sorry, that computing two power x power two to the power n cannot take less than n sequential squarings. And crucially, even if you have uh, a lot of parallel processors, let's say let's even allow an exponential number of parallel processors. In practice, these are probably all false assumptions. But the important thing is that, um, so, sorry, in practice, in theory, these are probably all false, because, uh, for example, you could think of uh, multi-modular algorithms. You could think of different complexity models where this parallel, this sequential hypothesis is false. But in practice, they seem to hold. And so if we want to give some concrete numbers to just fix an idea of how long this is going to take, let's take squaring's modulo a 2000 bits integer of a known factorization, of course. Uh, in software, this takes about one microsecond. And uh, the last time I checked, the record in FPGA was uh, around 20 nanoseconds. So this means that if you are targeting a delay of one hour, you will need to do two power 38 squarings um, two power fifty one if you're uh, two power fifty one if you're targeting a delay of one year, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so this is quite some computation, of course, but at least we we have a decent estimates of what this is going to imply in terms of computation. We shall see later that this is going to be a problem for exogeny based uh, delay functions. Apologies. Um, now. If we move to verifiable delay functions, I'm not going to show how one can do a verifiable delay function from the same uh, groups of unknown order. Um, there is a problem, of course, is that in the time block puzzle, we were using a trapdoor, and the trapdoor is what was allowing us to do the fast computation. But in verifiable delay function, everyone must be able to do the fast computation, so you cannot use a trapdoor. Um, and so you want to use groups of unknown order um, and then you need a way to prove that the computation was done correctly. And this is where you have two different ideas, uh, both very nice, one by Pitchrak and one by Veselowski, which were published about at the same time back in 2018 or 19, um, which give you an efficient proof of correct evaluation of uh, repeated squaring modulo n. Um, and then the thing you did after that is a group of unknown order. And now using RSA uh, groups is of course a reasonable solution, but it's problematic because you want that no one, no participant knows the factorization of the, uh, of the modulus, which means that you need a trusted setup to set up this thing, which is reasonable and which is something that uh, the uh, Ethereum Foundation, for example, has been going through to set up their own verifiable delay function. An alternative which has been used by Chia, for example, is to use class groups of imaginary quadratic fields, because these we know how to instantiate uh, without a trusted setup. Um, the back uh, the backside of the of class groups is that people trust them much less than they trust RSA groups, because these have been studied much less. So there is a little bit less confidence in class groups. Um, but both are definitely interesting. And now, finally, let's move to isogeny-based delay functions. Uh, as we shall see, uh, we can do um, verifiable delay functions from these, and we can uh, also implement this delay encryption I mentioned before, which is a generalization of time lock puzzles, at least in a certain sense. Um, so before I go into this, let's just uh, recall or define for the first time, uh, if you don't know, what an isogeny is. And now I apologize if uh, you've been uh, watching other talks by me on isogenies, you will have already seen some of these slides. I use them all of the time. Um, so it starts from an analytic curve. Isogenies are um, related to analytic curves and their group law. So you know that you have this chord and tangent law, uh, like the three collinear points, PQR in this figure, will sum to zero in this group law. Um, isogenies are morphisms of analytic curves which means that there are functions between elliptic curves that respect the group law. So uh, isogeny of P plus Q is going to be equal to isogeny of P plus isogeny of Q. Um, so if you want an analogy, uh, isogeny is R to elliptic curve what matrices are to vector spaces. Right? A matrix, a linear mapping is the most natural uh, concept of amorphism between vector spaces. An isogeny is the most natural uh, mapping of elliptic curves. What does an isogeny look like in practice? This is what we will need to know uh, for our protocols. Um, an isogeny is just a bunch of polynomials, a bunch of rational fractions, uh, more precisely. So in this example, you see two elliptic curves over the finite field with 11 elements. And uh, this polynomial mapping you see in the bottom left corner is an isogeny. Um, it is an isogeny which acts like this on the points of the elliptic curve. 
Um, so you see definitely that um, it's a two to one map. Uh, points that have pre images have exactly two pre images. Um, there is a lot of symmetry. You can see there is an axial symmetry, uh, like a vertical symmetry. And this is because this is a group morphism. So if you took all the lines, all the collinear points, you, you, you took any points that uh, are on the same line, you would see that their images, uh, when you map them through the red arrows, are also on the same line. Now, this is a bit difficult to see because, of course, lines over F11 wrap around, like when you play Snake, right? You can go out from the top and come back from the bottom. So it's not immediately clear how to uh, see the lines, but at least vertical lines are easy to see. And so you see that, for example, these two... Uh, I, do you see my mouse pointer? Nope. I think if I do this annotate... Ooh. Okay, now, if we do lost, not... now we lost the slides. <laughs> exactly, yeah, I don't see them anymore. So let me uh, do, uh, exit from this. Okay, now I don't see the slides anymore. <laughs> okay, so I stopped the sharing. Let me try to share again. Are they back? Yeah, they're okay. back. So, uh, well, um, take any pay, uh, points which are on a vertical line, on the same vertical line. Uh, don't follow my cursor because you don't see it. Uh, their images will be on the same vertical line. This is pretty obvious in the picture. And this means that two opposite points are sent to two opposite points, which is exactly what you expect from a group mapping. Okay, uh, group low aside, one thing that is important about the isogenies and that I'm going to use later uh, without uh, too much explanation, it's the degree of an isogeny. Uh, think of the degree as the amount of information that's needed to encode the isogeny. Right. So, for example, this is an, an isogeny of degree two. You see it because it's a two-to-one map. You also see it because the polynomials in the in its rational fraction description are of degree two. Uh, well, it's not always as simple, but usually they will show up as the degree of the polynomials. Um, and one last thing: um, that red point you see on the left, that's in the kernel of the isogeny. So that point is going to be sent to uh, the zero element of the curve on the right. And the zero element, it's the point at infinity, which I haven't drawn because I cannot draw the point at infinity in the plane like this. But so you can think of this point as being going uh, some way, somewhere out of the slide at infinity. Um, and if you really need an analogy for this kind of maps, think of them as squaring in a finite field. For example, squaring is a two to one map. Uh, in the finite field, uh, and it, it is a degree two map, and it kind respects the group law, or like the multiplicative group law of the finite field. So this is like the genus zero equivalent, if you like, of an isogeny. Um, it has much less interesting properties, but uh, it's kind of an analogy you, will, you can always keep in mind if you want if you want to think about the properties of an isogeny. Okay, uh, so. I hope this satisfies your curiosity. The only thing I will need in the end when we talk about practical aspects is to remember that an isogeny is just a kind of a, a bunch of polynomials. And usually we just want to look at one of these uh, rational fractions. So for example, we will only be interested in how the isogeny acts on the x, in, on the x coordinate here. So you only need to look at this polynomial x squared plus one divided by x. This is really going to be what's uh, in a implementation, in a computational sense from an implementation point of view, uh, this is going to be how we represent, how we compute the isogeny. And when I say evaluate an isogeny, I really mean take some x and put it into this rational function, as easy as that. Okay, and now uh, let's talk about isogeny graphs, because this is the abstraction that uh, is essentially behind all of isogeny-based cryptography. So what you're seeing here in this animation is an elliptic curve that's been deformed by uh, linear mappings. So I've been uh, squashing it along one axis. Now I am slanting it along another axis. All these transformations are represented by a, a matrix, a linear matrix. And the important thing is that they take straight lines to straight lines. So you saw that P, Q, and R were collinear. They are still collinear after these transformations. So this means that all these transformations preserve the group law of the elliptic curve. And so they must preserve all the group structure. This is what we call isomorphisms of elliptic curves because essentially, even if you do this linear transformation from a, an abstract point of view, this is the same elliptic curve. Nothing is changing on the about all the algebraic properties of this elliptic curve. And conveniently, we have something that's called the J invariant, which classifies all elliptic curves up to these linear transformations. Uh, 
Uh, it's very easy to compute if you have a virus trust equation, for example, of this LT curve, then the J variant is given by this formula, 1728 times four times A cubed divided by four times A cubed plus 27 B squared, whatever. The important thing is that given an equation of an analytic curve, it's easy to compute the J variant, and given a J variant, it's easy to compute any equation for this LT curve. So instead of thinking of LT curve, we will only take, think of LT curves up to isomorphisms. So we can think of J invariants in the end. Now, zooming is also a linear transformation. And so we will zoom out until we only see the J invariant. And then what we are interested in is thinking about LT curves up to isomorphisms and isogenies between them up to composition with isomorphisms. Of course, an isogeny is a group morphism. You compose it with an isomorphism, it's still going to be an iso a group morphism. Plus, composing with an isomorphism is not going to change the degree of the isogeny because isomorphisms are isogenies of degree one. Big secret. So we can just start drawing these kind of diagrams where vertices are just, uh, just represent J invariants, classes of elliptic curves up to isomorphisms, and edges between two vertices we represent isogenies up to composition with an isomorphism. Very important theorem, whenever you have an isogeny that goes from A to B, you also have a second isogeny which goes from B to A. And this second isogeny, which is called the dual isogeny, will have the same degree as the first isogeny. So usually we tend to draw these diagrams as undirected diagrams because you can always change the direction of the arrows Plus, this change of direction um, is uh, easy to do in polynomial time, actually even in quasi-linear time. You can really easily, uh, from the description of an isogeny, compute a description of its dual isogeny. So um, everything is, is straightforward here. We will only draw uh, under edit diagrams. And we, when we do this, we get these beautiful diagrams, which you may already have seen in many other talks on isogeny-based cryptography. I owe uh, to Lawrence Panny these beautiful uh, pictures. On the left side, you see uh, the what some people call the seaside diagram, uh, the seaside graph, uh, what I like to call a complex multiplication graph, personally. Um, this is what's behind uh, the seaside key exchange scheme and uh, many other schemes which use uh, the, this kind of class group action-based cryptography, if you're familiar with it. On the right-hand side, what you see is the full super singular isogeny graph of two degrees, which are represented by two colors. So this is the kind of diagram that's behind SIDH, the SIDH case change scheme, uh, and the psych candidate to the NIST competition, if you're familiar with it. Um, and now, you may ask which of these two graphs is good for isogeny-based uh, time delay cryptography. The answer is both um, for essentially the same reason is that um, like the structure of these graphs is very important for uh, post-quantum crypto because depending on which one you choose, different algorithms will be used for uh, recovering, uh, for uh, breaking uh, the security assumptions. When you move to time delay cryptography, it becomes much less important. Of course, there are still differences depending on which one you choose, uh, but essentially the only thing we need is not all this uh, combinatorial complexity of having all the graph. What we want is just a long walk in the graph. This is all we are going to need for isogeny based delay crypto. And so how we do, for example, uh, VDFs uh, in this kind of graphs. So um, the, the only thing we, we need is going to be a very long, path of isogenies inside an isogeny graph. So if you look back at these kind of uh, graphs, think just of some random walk in any of the two graphs on the left or on the right, um, which goes through many uh, different uh, points. Um, so um, your setup for the verifiable delay function will be a delay parameter, uh, call it T, I called it delta before, I don't know why I changed from delta to T, um, and an isogeny cycle, so it's just a sequence of, uh, I'd rather call it an isogeny walk, a sequence of isogenies from st some starting elliptic curve Z0 to some ending final elliptic curve ET. Um, and so the if, for example, I take all these isogenies being of degree two, that's one possible choice, uh, the resulting composition of isogenies will be an isogeny, uh, an isogeny of degree two power t, because the degree is multiplicative the same way that when you compose polynomials, uh, the degree of polynomials multiplies. Um, 
And so this is going to be my setup. I just decide the starting curve is zero. I compute the long isogeny, and I want this isogeny to be this isogeny walk to be very long, so this degree to be very large, um, so that it will take some amount of time to go through all these curves uh, in sequence. And then the verifiable delay function, the evaluation function, will be just the isogeny itself. So our, our VDF is just going to be take a point P, a random point P in the start elliptic curve in E0 and map it to phi of P, the image of this point through the isogenies. And you can compute this image by going in sequence through each, of isogen each isogeny of degree two. Um, this is going to take for each step something that's comparable to squaring. Uh, it's very similar. You saw it, it was a, a polynomial of degree two. So it's very, going to be very similar to take x, then x squared, then x power four, et cetera. Uh, and conjecturally, as far as we know, there is no faster way to do this kind of uh, computation other than composing these isogeny. So going slowly uh, through this degree two isogeny in sequence one after the other. And then the question is, how do I verify? Uh, how do I find this shortcut that lets me verify? So we are kind of the same uh, uh, problem we had with the uh, uh, group-based verifiable delay function, where not having the trapdoor, we weren't able to uh, do the, the operation faster. So we need a way to prove that this evaluation has been done correctly. And this is where uh, one very cute property of isogenies, which is something that everyone who likes to work with isogeny should know, is the compatibility of isogenies with, with pairings. Uh, this is a very simple equation, which is going to look familiar to anyone who's worked with pairings. Um, take an isogeny phi from some curve E to E prime and take the dual isogeny that goes back from E prime to E. Then the valid pairings, uh, but also any other pairing actually, could be Tate pairings, but let's talk about the valid pairing. The valid pairings of these two LT curves, the valid pairing on E and the valid pairing on E prime, will be linear with respect to, um, uh, to this isogeny phi, in a sense. In the precise sense that when you apply phi on one side of the pairing, you can bring it to the other side of the pairing by taking the dual. So E prime of phi p and q is equal to E of p and phi hat, phi dual, applied to q. And here you just need to check that you have typed things correctly so that P is on the first curve for E and Q is on the second curve, E prime. And then you're just like the D isogeny brings the points on the same curve. On one side, on the left side of this equation, they are both on E. And on the right side of this equation, they're both on E prime. Um, An easy corollary is that um, if now you, you change uh, things so that you apply the isogeny on both sides of the, uh, of the pairing, uh, then this thing is going to get out of the pairing as the degree of the isogeny. It's a very easy corollary to prove. So in some sense, this is really behaving like scalars. You know that when you have a pairing and you take a, an integer, you can multiply it on the left or on the right side of the, uh, of the pairing or take it out of the pairing. With isogeny, it's just slightly more complicated in that when you move it from one side to the other, you get the dual. And when you want to take out the isogeny, well, you need to have two isogenies to take out the degree. Um, and so now, how can you use this uh, to uh, have a verifiable delay function? This is the generic concept. Uh, technically, it needs a little bit more work, but I won't go into the details how you do this. Uh, the, details, the details were presented in, to, in uh, this paper at uh, Asia Crip 2019. The setup is as I described. You start from a pairing friendly LT curve E, you will actually need it to be super senior uh, for practical reasons. Although in theory, this could work with ordinary curves if we knew how to do them. If you knew how to generate suitable pairing, ordinary pairing friendly LT curves. Uh, then you take an isogeny phi from this starting curve E to some new curve E prime of degree, um, before I said two power something, you can take in more generally some, any fixed to small prime L to power something. And then you will fix a point on the starting curve E and its image by this isogeny on the arrival curve E prime. The slow evaluation function, the verifiable delay function is just going to be evaluation of the isogeny or more precisely evaluation of the dual isogeny. Uh, of course, the dual of the dual, it's the isogeny itself. So you can just swap the rules and decide that uh, the uh, like phi is the dual and phi hat is the, is the prime. And then verification is just going to be checking the pairing equation checking that the point P and its image phi P in the setup are consistent with the point Q and its image point phi out of Q in the evaluation. 
and that's it. And actually, this is very um, convenient in that not only it shows that um, it com it's, it's a convincing proof that the evaluation was done right, it's actually a proof that phi hat of Q is the exact image of Q. This protocol has perfect soundness, unlike the other group-based protocols. Um, if you are able to find a point that uh, satisfies a verifier, then that point is the correct output. So that also means that if you can break a peering inversion problem, then you have broken the time delay assumption of isogeny based delay functions, uh, which shows that these things are not uh, post-quantum secure because it's enough to break uh, a peering assumption. It's actually just enough to compute a, a bunch of discrete logarithms. Um, there is something I didn't tell you is that even though it didn't seem so we actually need a trusted setup in these isogeny based constructions. The reason for why uh, I'm go not going to go through because I'm almost out of time. Uh, however, this trusted setup, it's a very nice trusted setup, which has much better properties than uh, trusted setup for RSA groups, for example. Um, best attacks against uh, all these uh, verify, all these delay functions are always sub exponential uh, on a classical computer. Uh, either L one third or L one half, um, and none of this, as I said, is quantum safe. Although there is some kind of quantum annoyance property, if you've read about uh, some papers uh, on uh, quantum annoyness, um, one version of the isogeny based verifiable delay function has it. Um, plus some other properties which are not going through, through such as water marking and uh, aggregation of proofs. That's um, uh, secondary, I would say. And now just to finish uh, the talk, um, let's talk about this delay encryption, which I promised to you. Um, so as I promised to you, delay encryption is a primitive which generalizes at the same time, both time lock puzzles and verifiable delay functions in a way which is analogous to the way that identity-based encryption generalizes both public key encryption and signatures. Uh, now, how IB generalizes public key encryption, it's pretty obvious. Um, how IB implies signatures, it's maybe slightly less known, um, but uh, it's, it's a very old trick, which, uh, which was already um, uh, presented by Boney and Franklin in their seminal IB paper. Um, and so since I spoke about Boney and Franklin, let's see how you, we can start from the Boney and Franklin IB scheme and derive a uh, delay uh, encryption. So um, let's start from identity-based encryption. What's identity-based encryption? It's a primitive with four algorithms. Key generation, which generates a master secret key and a public key. Um, the public key can be used to encrypt any message. And so you have this encrypted box in, on the left, which is the encryption. Uh, and encryption will also take as input the identity of the owner of the uh, uh, recipient of the message. Uh, so I will represent identities by the doge. Um, on the right-hand side, you have this extract algorithm, which uh, takes as input to the master secret key and the identity. And from these two inputs derives the secret key associated to the identity. And so using this derived secret key, this extracted secret key, now you can take a ciphertext uh, written for that identity and decrypt it to get the original message back. So this is the simple schematic view of the identity-based encryption. And delay encryption is just a uh, translation of this to the time delay word, where, um, we, uh, where we are going to ask that extraction is a slow functionality. Um, and so now let's see how the Boney and Franklin uh, IB works. The idea is that a key generation, you will just generate a standard uh, discrete log key pair. So you have some generator G2 of a pairing group, and you will take a secret scalar M, which is going to master secret key, and the public key is going to be M times G2. And now uh, what you're going to do is that you are going to encrypt by using a pairing to derive a symmetric key. Uh, the symmetric key will be derived by putting the uh, both the public key, M times G2, and the identity uh, masked by a secret scalar U, inside uh, a pairing. And now K, the output of this pairing, uh, pairing of U times the identity and the public key will be the encryption key you use to encrypt the message. And then you will publish the, um, along with the message, uh, a masking of U uh, as U times this generator G2. 
to do the extraction, to extract the identity related secret key from the master key, what you will do is you will just multiply the identity, which we're going to suppose it's a, a point uh, in the other pairing group in G1. Uh, you will apply the master secret to this point. So you will have M times the identity. And now you will put again uh, the uh, second part of the ciphertext, U times G2, and the secret key uh, associated to the identity inside the pairing equation. You see that all we have done is that we have swapped the secrets M and U within the pairing. So we will get exactly the same uh, symmetric key K from this. And then we will use this symmetric key to um, decode uh, the message. Um, so this is how uh, the Boney and Franklin identity-based scheme works. And now our goal to get to delay encryption is just to make instructions loop. So how are we gonna do this? It's pretty straightforward. So you remember that we had this pairing equation where we could put, instead of putting scalars, we could put isogenies in. And you remember that isogenies can be used as delay functions. We're just going to replace one of the scalars by an isogeny. And you can guess which one we want to replace. It is going to be the scalar M, the master secret, so that we will get extraction, which becomes applying the isogeny phi to the identity. So extraction is going to become slow, but be careful, another operation that's going to become slow is the setup. So at setup time, we will have a very slow operation, which is deriving the public key from um, the master secret key. This is something that we need to do only once. And then after this is done, everyone in possession of the public key will be able to encrypt the message to this public key and to any identity. And then to get the extraction key associated to an identity, we will need to run this low isogeny evaluation operation, which will derive uh, phi associated to the identity. And then the encryption works the same. So now we have a protocol where um, an identity is going to be this time, this time capsule that we want to encrypt to. So let's say I want to encrypt to the future, I will generate an identity. Uh, I need this identity to be a random identity, and this will represent uh, the capsule. Then anyone who wants to add things to this time capsule will encrypt a message to this identity, and the decryption key for this time capsule will only be available sometimes in the future when the extraction will be done. And so we have re exactly realized this ideal functionality of, of having this time lock capsule where everyone can encrypt but which we will only be able to open sometimes in the future. Um, for concreteness, what does this kind of uh, delay isogenies look like? As you remember from my previous example, isogenies are just rational fractions of degree two, for example, if you are using degree two isogenies. So instead of doing repeated square module on integer n uh, of a known factorization, in this instance, we will we'll do, be doing a repeating uh, square polynomial, square rational fraction, module some prime p, and this prime can be public and everyone can know it in advance. So that actually it's even easier to optimize for the specific prime without needing for a complicated trusted setup. Um, typical parameters will be uh, for, for having the pairing security will be lock P around the 2000 bits, maybe slightly less to get something that's comparable to RSA 2048. And so for a one hour delay, you will need an isogeny path using the same kind of ballpark estimate we use for RSA that's going to be of length 10 to the power 10. That's a huge isogeny path, which is going to take uh, lots and lots of data to store. And so at the moment we estimate that to store this information that's associated to uh, a one hour delay, you would need about 17 terabytes of data. But this is not the worst because 17 terabytes of data, it's fine. Uh, I mean, you can buy storage at a reasonable price to store them. The real problem is the throughput. When you want to do the evaluation, you need to pull this data from memory at a very fast pace. Uh, and so we estimate that with current technology, we will need to, 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 to have a throughput of about four gigabytes per second, which is something we could achieve, but it's going to be very costly to achieve. We'd really need to think our, um, uh, our um, devices to do the evaluation in a very special way that makes this throughput possible for such a large amount of storage. So, it, it's very tough to really implement this stuff and it, it, it's a serious problem uh, today if we want really to do these things in practice. Um, okay, so just to uh, conclude, um, open questions. Um, of course, first thing is script analysis. How 
believable are these assumptions uh, that I just uh, showed to you. Um, we kind of believe in them at this point. They look relatively solid, but of course, more work is needed. Um, Understanding this practical implication of this large bandwidth requirement, uh, can we do time memory trade-offs and uh, how reasonable are they for which application they're reasonable? That's of course an interesting problem. As I mentioned, but didn't show it to you, removing trusted setups is uh, a problem. Um, there's at least two possible ways we can think of, unlike the RSA setup, where it's clear that you need a trusted setup because there is a trapdoor. Here, the trusted setup is not a trapdoor. Uh, well, I mean, there is a trapdoor, but there is no obvious way, reason why it should be there. There is an obvious uh, thing with that if we knew how to do, we could get rid of the trusted setup. But this is a major open problem in isogeny-based cryptography, uh, which we have been uh, ho hoping to solve for at least 10 years now. So uh, it's, it's called hashing into the Cyber Singer set. Many people have, try, have tried and many people have failed so far. Um, one important thing, I think it would be to try and generalize this kind of construction, see what else we can do by using this peering plus uh, I delay isogenous constructions. Can we do more? Um, and of course, something I would really like to see is just people going uh, hardcore into implementing this stuff and putting resources into trying to implement this thing in hardware and see how fast you can do this repeated isogeny. So the mantra is just add isogeny to your pairing protocol and see what happens. And I hope that more things will happen. Um, so I end here, and uh, this is my last slide. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, uh, and please implement this very simple delay function. Okay, very cool. Thanks a lot, Luca, for this uh, very nice talk. Um, I will stop the live stream and the recording, and then we can we go to the Q and A session.